I started a series of lessons and they are entitled this, The Sayings of the crucifixion. Now, if you go back, you'll find that the last lesson that I preached in this series was the middle of May. That's a long time ago, isn't it? The middle of May. It's amazing how quickly time flies. But in that particular lesson, we ended with Jesus' arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus had gone into the garden to pray. He prayed there three times. And all of a sudden, a mob shows up in the garden. And one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, was leading the mob and betrayed our Lord that night with a kiss, did he not? Jesus was then arrested. And my friends, if you continue to read the synoptic gospels, by that we mean the gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're called synoptic because they're all very, very similar one to another. If you read those gospels, what you find is that Jesus, it appears, was immediately led into the palace of the high priest and stood before the high priest named Caiaphas. But, If you read John's Gospel, you find out that something happened prior to Jesus standing before Caiaphas. The Bible says that Jesus was taken first to Annas. We read of that in John 18 verse 12. And the band and the captain and the officers of the Jews bound Jesus and took Him away to Annas first. Now some individuals might think that that is a reflection, in fact a bad reflection, on inspiration. If you're reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it sounds like he was led immediately to Caiaphas. But if you read John's Gospel, the Bible says that he was led first to Annas. So how do we resolve the conflict? Well, one thing we know is this. The Holy Spirit chose not to reveal unto Matthew, Mark, and Luke the fact that Jesus went first to Annas. Now, if you have problems with that, all you have to do is go ask the Holy Spirit. Now, you won't be able to do that now. You'll have to die and go ask Him later. But I think there's an easier explanation, folks. Matthew, Mark, and Luke had either fled or were not present. The only apostle was Matthew. The Bible says that the disciples forsook him and fled, did they not? Mark and Luke were not even there on that particular occasion. But what we do find is that John was present right there in the palace of the high priest at the arrest of Jesus. Listen to what the Bible says. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did the other disciple. Folks, that other disciple is guess who? That other disciple is John. This disciple was known under the high priest. Now notice what the Bible says. And went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. Folks, John, because of his familiarity with the high priest, was allowed to go right into the palace of the high priest when Jesus went in. He knew exactly what transpired on that evening. And he knew that Jesus went first to Annas before he went to Caiaphas. The question we might ask is this, who is this Annas then? Well, let's talk about him very briefly. First, he too was a high priest from A.D. 6 until A.D. 14 or 15. Now, when you study about Annas, what you find is there is some discrepancies among the commentators as to whether at the time of Jesus' arrest he was still a high priest or he was just carrying that particular name. We do that with presidents, don't we? Today we still refer to past presidents as President so-and-so, President Obama, President Bush. And they're not even occupying the office anymore. So it may have been that he had occupied the office, but they still honored him by referring to him as the high priest. And he also continued to occupy a very high position, possibly even the president of the Sanhedrin court. 
Now, most individuals believe that he was asked to resign by the Roman government in A.D. 14. And guess what he did? He immediately put in his son-in-law as the high priest. Question. If his son-in-law is the high priest, and he has occupied the position of high priest, does he still have influence in the nation of Israel? Absolutely. At this particular time, he still was highly respected among the Jews, folks. He was respected because he had held the office. He was respected for his wisdom. He was respected for his experiences in trying prior cases. He was respected for his knowledge of the law. He was respected for his knowledge of judicial precedent at that particular time. And so when they bring in Jesus... In order to be tried that night, the very first place they took him was to the aged man by the name of Annas. Now, it's hard to tell two stories at one time. But right now, there are two things happening simultaneously. Now, that shouldn't surprise us, should it? All of us are in here and we're carrying out our worship. But on the outside of this building, there are individuals who are going about their lives. There are many events happening right now in our world simultaneously. The same was true at this particular time. Remember we said a while ago that Peter and John had followed Jesus? And when they get to the palace of the high priest, the very first one, because of his knowledge of the high priest, was given access into the palace itself, John. Poor old Peter, he had to stand outside for a while until John gained him access into the palace as well. Notice what it says. But Peter stood at the door without... Now notice what it says. Then went out that disciple, which was known of the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. Folks, think about that. We now have two disciples in the palace of the high priest. As the events are transpiring in the trial of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In our next lesson... We're going to go back to this particular story and talk about some of the things that were said while the trial of Jesus is being conducted in front of Annas, the high priest. The title of our lesson tonight could be very simply this, Jesus before Annas. Tonight we're going to be looking at three statements that were made. Remember, that's what this series of lessons is all about. All of the statements that were made from the time that Jesus left the upper room with His disciples until He ascends back to the right hand of the throne of God. And just look at the content. Just look at what's being said during the course of the Passion Night. And it is extremely revealing, isn't it? Get the picture. Jesus is arrested. Jesus is bound. He's in the palace of the high priest. He's standing before an ex-high priest. He's standing before the father-in-law of the present high priest, a man by the name of Annas. And my friends, remember, it is late, late at night, isn't it? The very first statement involves the fact that Jesus was a very transparent individual. We turn to John 18, verse 19. Look at what the Bible says. The high priest, that's Annas, then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Folks, here's something we need to understand. Movements make leaders who are in positions of power tremble, don't they? We're talking about the high priest. We're talking about a man who is number one in the nation of Israel. We are talking about the supreme spiritual leader of this nation. And he's heard of this movement, has he not? He's heard of this man named Jesus. He knows that this man is the carpenter's son who 
acts as though he's a rabbi who goes about performing wonderful miracles in front of the people, who has established a movement in the nation of Israel. Now when a movement starts, leaders want to know three things at least. Number one, they want to know the leader. Well, guess what? Now they have him, don't they? And there Jesus is standing right in front of the high priest himself. Got him. Our plan to have him arrested has worked. Judas did his dastardly deed and we have the leader of this movement. Now what does he want to know? Two things. I want to know about his doctrine. Folks, you want to know something about their beliefs, don't you? What is it that this Jesus is talking about? What are his tenets of faith? What is it that is motivating his followers? So he asked him about his doctrine, but notice also the Bible says that he had asked him about his disciples, the adherents. Folks, when a movement starts, you want to know who these people are that are being influenced, don't you? What are their ages? What is their gender? What is their background? Why is it that they are so eagerly enticed by the things that they are hearing? Why are they being moved away from the basic tenets of Judaism to this particular man? So Annas asked him about his disciples and about his doctrine. Now, here's something we need to keep in mind. Folks, sometimes questions have ulterior motives, don't they? You've never asked a question, not for yourself, but for someone else, have you? Never done that? You probably put a couple in the box back there. You already knew the answer. You wanted me to give the answer to somebody else. So that you could say, see there, the preacher even said it. Folks, Jesus knew who He was standing in front of, don't you think? He knew this was the older high priest. And now He's asking him, me about what? He's asking me about my disciples? He's asking me about my doctrine? I mean, I've been arrested. They've got me standing here bound in front of this man. What are His motives? Why does He want to know this stuff? So... In verses 20 and 21, Jesus answers the high priest, but guess what? He does not open him, or does not answer him directly. Jesus begins by talking about his openness. Remember, I was, the point is that Jesus is a transparent teacher, is he not? Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus answered him, I speak openly to the world. And I have taught in the synagogue and in the temple whether the Jews always resort. And in secret I have said nothing. Now remember, he's asking him about what? I want to know about your disciples. I want to know about your doctrine. Jesus says, wait just a minute. He says, first of all, I've been openly speaking in at least three places. Isn't that what he says? I speak openly in the world. What he means by that is wherever I go, I'm open. Wherever I've gone, I've been transparent. It doesn't matter whether it's the masses or whether it's an individual. It doesn't matter whether it's by the Jordan or whether it is in a mountain and I'm speaking the Sermon on the Mount. Everything that I've ever said has been spoken openly. He says, and by the way, guys, I've been in your synagogue. Folks, there's the place of worship, is it not, on the Sabbath day. This is where the Jews go and gather in order to receive instruction. Jesus said, you know, I've even been right there in the synagogue itself teaching. And by the way, I've been in the temple area too. And I've spoken there. He then makes the affirmation that Nothing that I've ever said has been spoken in secret. Isn't that what he says? And in secret have I said nothing. Last week, 
On Sunday evening's lesson, we talked about Ephesians 6, 19, didn't we? And how Paul asked the church at Ephesus to pray that he would be a bold speaker. My friends, look here. Jesus is a man of boldness, is He not? Jesus tells this high priest, look, I've never concealed anything from anybody. I've always spoken openly. I've been in your synagogues. I've been at the temple. Individuals have heard everything that I have said. I have never ever tried to hide anything from anybody. My friends, you and I could learn a lesson. You know that? We need to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. There is this attitude today that we don't really need to speak plainly and frankly. We don't need to just lay things out there the way they need to be laid out there. We need to kind of cover things up. We need to kind of conceal things. We call it tact, don't we? We need to kind of beat around the bush. and We need to kind of slip it through the back door. Folks, that's not Jesus. That's not Jesus. Jesus spoke openly. Jesus spoke frankly. And He concealed absolutely nothing from anybody. And He makes that affirmation. I am transparent in what I teach. Isn't that the way we need to be in our teaching? Notice secondly, Jesus asked them to consult the witnesses in the very next verse. Look what He says. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me what I have said. Behold, they know what I said. Wow. Notice first, Jesus' is confidence, isn't He? Folks, Jesus has been around enough. He's spoken enough to the masses that were in Jerusalem and in Judea, in Canaan. He knew. They know exactly what I'm teaching. I'm confident of that. Here's my question to us. Do other individuals who are around us, who know us, folks, are they confident, are we confident that they know what we believe? Isn't that something? Jesus had taught so much publicly that He was confident others knew exactly what He taught. Do you know there's people in Jacksonville who don't even know who the churches of Christ are? you believe that? I'll guarantee you. You can knock on some doors and you say, Hey, I'm from the church of Christ. You know what they'd say? Who are y'all? Never heard of y'all. Folks, that's not the way it was with Jesus. He was well known and His teachings were well known at that particular time. What Jesus is trying to get these individuals to understand is this. I know this is a ridiculous arrest. Now think about what's going on. They've arrested Him. They brought Him in before the high priest. And the high priest says, Hey, what about your disciples? What about your doctrine? Jesus just shakes His head. Are you kidding me? Is this why you've arrested me? Is this why I'm standing here past midnight tonight? You could have already known about any of this. You could have asked anybody in the city of Jerusalem. You could have asked anybody in Judah. If you want to know about my disciples, if you want to know about my doctrine, just go ask them. It's a ridiculous arrest if this is all that you've brought me here for. Folks, remember what I said a while ago? Sometimes questions have ulterior motives. Don't they? Here's something else we need to understand before we go on in our study. Folks, this was an illegal trial that the Jews were carrying on. Did you know that? As we go through this trial of Jesus, we're going to find many illegalities in this trial. And Jesus knew that. Folks, this trial was being conducted at night. 
In the Talmud, there is a statement made and it says this, criminal processes can neither commence nor terminate, watch this, but during the course of the day. Question, do you think the high priest knew that? You think the high priest knew judicial order? Absolutely. He knew this shouldn't be going on. He knew this trial was an illegal trial. And yet, here they were trying Jesus at night. Wow. You see, the Bible tells us that Jesus' judgment was taken away. It had been prophesied by Isaiah in Isaiah 53 verse 8. Do you remember when Philip joined himself to the Ethiopian eunuch and the eunuch was reading from the book of Isaiah, folks? He was reading from that very passage right there. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. The Jews didn't care about justice. The Jews didn't care about the law. The Jews didn't care about anything but the destruction of Jesus Christ. And Jesus knew that as He stood before that high priest. Injustice could care less about the law. You know that? They don't care. Law means absolutely nothing as far as injustice is concerned. It is only concerned about the agenda and the end that it wants to accomplish. The Jews are going to destroy Jesus this night if they possibly can. And who cares about law? Wow. Now, Jesus has been pretty bold in His statement to the high priest, hasn't He? I've spoken openly. You want to know what I believe? You just go out there and ask them. They'll tell you what I believe. That leads us to our next point. An accusation of disrespect. That's found in verse 22. And when He had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by watch this, struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, watch this, answerest thou the high priest so? This man that was standing by was what we might refer to as a subordinate officer. He may have been one of those officers of the Jews that had taken Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And now here he was standing beside Jesus as he's listening him talking to the high priest. And the very minute he hears Jesus' words, he is enraged, is he not? Who is this man talking to the high priest like this? Now he may have been somewhat concerned about the law of Moses. Folks, in Exodus twenty-two twenty-eight, the Bible says this, Thou shalt not revile the gods, nor speak evil of the ruler of thy people. That little term, curse the gods, that little word gods there stands for the judges of Israel. Do not revile the judges, those who stand in the place of God. God is the ultimate judge, is He not? And there are individuals in the land who stand in the place of God as judges and they have the responsibility of upholding justice. And my friends, you do not revile the gods. You do not speak evil of dignitaries. And this man may have thought Jesus was doing actually that. And what does he do? He takes the palm of his hand and he just smites Jesus, doesn't he? Can you imagine the pop in that room that night? We've got a lesson that's there. And it's this, folks. Poor leaders, immature leaders, they don't have a clue as to how to properly deal with bold opposition. 
Now guess what? When you're a leader, individuals are going to oppose you. There's no doubt about that. They're not going to agree with everything. They're going to challenge you. And some of those individuals are going to challenge you boldly and directly. Jesus was doing that to the high priest. He wasn't being disrespectful. But He was letting the high priest know, I know what's going on here tonight. If you wanted to know about what I teach, you could have known that easily. Why have you really brought me here? That's what Jesus is wanting to know. And this subordinate leader gets so angry with Jesus that he slaps him. You see, rather than exhibiting humility, they exhibit pride. Can you imagine that subordinate officer standing there? Who does this Jesus think He is talking to the high priest that way? Don't you know who you're talking to? You see, when people get in positions of power, they oftentimes get arrogant, don't they? Notice also, they exhibit ignorance. The man didn't listen to what Jesus said, did he? He had no adequate response. There was no answer to Jesus other than slap Him with the palm of His hand. And that leads to their immaturity. Those leaders who are mature, they don't get angry and upset. They don't get bent out of shape. They don't resort to violence like this individual. Weak leaders, immature leaders act like that. I find it interesting in the Scripture, when there are qualifications of elders, the Holy Spirit addresses these kind of matters. Did you know that? In the qualifications of these men. 1 Timothy 3, verse 3. An elder is to be no striker. Here a man is in a position of leadership, folks. He is not supposed to get so angry and upset that he would smite another individual. I've heard of elders' meetings and men's meetings where literal fist fights have broken out in churches. Unbelievable, isn't it? The Bible says in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 3 that an elder is to be no brawler. Titus 1 verse 7, an elder is to be a man who is not soon angry. Folks, God wants strong leaders, mature leaders, in those positions. He wants individuals who are in control of themselves. Individuals who, in the face of bold opposition, are able to keep their composure. Individuals who are able to listen. Individuals who are able to give an answer. Individuals who know how to conduct themselves righteously before the opposition. That was not what was happening that night. This, this subordinate officer was showing how weak he truly was. Notice this. Folks, we find a second violation of the laws of justice among the Jews. The law said this, no punishment, no punishment at all, was to be meted out against an individual until he was convicted of a crime. No punishment. Why was this man slapping Jesus because he thought he was guilty of disrespect. He hadn't been charged with that. He hadn't been convicted of that. And yet, here was this officer punishing him for that. Wow. Punishment of any kind among the Jews could only be authorized by the individual who was conducting the hearing. Who was the hearing being conducted by? Annas the high priest. And the only way any punishment should have been given to any individual, including Jesus, was for Annas to authorize the punishment. He had authorized nothing against Jesus on that occasion. My friends, the law is violated for a second time. Trial at night... And Jesus has already been smitten on the face. You see, the Jews could care less about the law. That leads us to point number three. 
Jesus calls for evidence, folks. That's in verse 23. Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if I have spoken well, why smitest thou me? Well, Jesus is pretty bold, isn't he? Again. Folks, Jesus turned to that man and he asked for proof, didn't he? Where's your evidence? Where's the proof that I've spoken evilly? That little word evil is an interesting word. It means this, badly. Thayer says that it means improperly, wrongly. I can just see Jesus. He takes that blow and He just turns and He looks at that man and He says, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. If you think that I have disrespected the high priest, you prove it. That's what He's asking for, isn't it? Folks, again, we're talking about injustice. And injustice does not care about the facts. Jesus had not been disrespectful. Had He been bold? Yes. But had He told the truth? Yes. Was He exposing this trial for what it was truly all about? It's not about justice. It's not about finding out about me. It's not about a sentence. It's to destroy me. But you see... Injustice doesn't care for law, and injustice doesn't care for facts. Don't bother me with the facts. And they could care less about it that night. But here's what's interesting. Jesus says, if I have spoken well, if you can't prove that I've spoken evil, then I want to know why you've smitten me. There's two things Jesus does. Number one, He rebukes that lower officer, doesn't He? That's what He does. Where's your facts, man? You done hit me across the face. Where's your facts? He's got none. And you don't see a response to Jesus at all in the text. There are no responses. And what's interesting as well, if there were no wrongdoing, then this man acted inappropriately in a court of law. And Jesus wanted that on the record. And it is on the record. In the divine record of God's Word. I've been smitten when there's no evidence for the wrongness of my statement. And folks, it is recorded in history, is it not? Forever and ever and ever. Pretty powerful stuff, isn't it? Annas was probably glad that night that I am high priest in name only. You know that? He hadn't hardly talked to Jesus. But guess what? I bet he knew. I'm not going to get much out of this man. This man is bold. This man knows what he's talking about. This man knows how to argue his case in court. I'm not going to get much from him. And it's also new that emotions were running high, didn't he? One simple answer from Jesus and one of his officers smites Jesus on the cheek. He knew emotions are way up there when it comes to this man. And thirdly, he probably understood that what's going on here this evening is not in harmony with the law. Interesting. Look at that next verse. Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas, the high priest. Wow. He wouldn't release Jesus. Isn't that interesting? When we let him go, now think about that. Here's an old man. He'd been in the position of high priest. He judged cases before. He knew what's going on this evening. But guess what? I'm not letting him go. Not me. But 
he would not be responsible for the trial of the Son of God. Folks, here's a lesson. There are some leaders who have no problem passing the buck. You know that? I can just see Annas, don't you? <laughs> There's another dude over here that's really the high priest. Get him over there to Caiaphas. Let him take care of this. You see, they are not willing to take personal responsibility for the matters at hand. That's not a leader, folks. That's not a leader. And we're going to see another one of those in the course of this trial, aren't we? Leaders passing the buck. What I want us to get away from as we start the trial of Jesus is this, folks. This trial was a kangaroo court with one end in mind, and that is to do away with the Son of God. It's almost hard for us to comprehend, isn't it? Here are the children of God. Here are the rulers of God's people acting unjustly. Folks, if this is where the leaders are, what do you expect of the nation itself? It's amazing, isn't it? My prayer is that we, as the children of God today, will learn from these individuals and my friends, let's execute justice in our world. Let's pay attention to truth. Let's pay attention to law. Let's pay attention to the facts and not disregard them. That is especially true when it comes to matters of salvation, isn't it? You see, there's some people out in our world, they're not concerned about the truth and facts. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You'll never change that. John 16, 16. Maybe you need to do that tonight. If you'll believe in the Christ, repent of sins, confess His name, we'll immerse you into Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Dear Christians, aren't you thankful that Jesus went through the humiliation? Aren't you glad that His judgment was taken away from Him so that when you and I stand before God to be judged, we'll be judged in righteousness? Maybe you need to repent of sin. Ask God to forgive you of that. Live a godly, righteous life before Him. If you need to do that tonight, won't you come as we stand and sing?